thank you for joining us once again in another of our webinar series in the Yada No uh, ongoing saga. Um, today's uh, webinar is a, a deep uh, dive into, uh, I think, a little bit more technical than what we normally do. Um, we'll be doing a step-by-step -step guide to installing Yada Energy's commercial three-phase microinverter, affectionately known around the office and at your local distributor as the DPI-208 and DPI-480. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming out and joining us today. I see some familiar faces. Uh, a lot of you I know have upcoming installs uh, that you're prepping for and hoping to get a, a few of the uh, best practices and, and secret hints that uh, only Chris Barrett can provide you uh, using our product. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you out in the field soon. So thank you for joining us today. I, of course, am Ryan Davies, the VP of Sales here at Yada Energy. And as always, I am joined by my good friend and colleague, Mr. Christopher Barrett, our Senior Director of Applications Engineering. Don't leave before we wrap up the Q&A, just before we get to your questions and answers, which we'll take care of at the end of the webinar. Please type them in the chat as we move through. Uh, we'll be selecting one person at random to be uh, chosen as our lucky winner of the Yada Swag Giveaway Prize. Uh, we'll choose one person and somebody from marketing will reach out to you and mail you a package full of our very convention popular uh, Yada uh, merchandise. As you can see, we have a very healthy agenda today that focuses on not only the installation of our microinverter uh, solution, but also our uh, solar leaf brief overview of the solar leaf rooftop battery solution. I'll tell you a little bit about Yada Energy just before I kick things on over to Chris. Around here at Yada, we like to say energy made simple. Yada is leading the transition to clean renewable energy by making energy simple. We were founded back in March 2017, so we just celebrated our sixth birthday not long ago. We are headquartered in Austin, Texas, where we have, it says 35, but probably closer to 40 employees these days. Um, anytime you stop by the office, which of course, if you are in Austin, I would encourage you to swing by the office and say hello. It is something to be seen. We have a uh, great presence there in, in Austin. So please come by and see us at any time. Uh, we have a number of awards and recognitions, uh, too many to go through. You can see a couple of them um, demonstrated there, but you can go onto our website to see a full list of the different awards and, and recognitions that we've received over the years. Who are we? Again, energy made simple. Now we have a complete range of distributed solar energy technologies for the commercial and industrial market. I'll say that again, for the commercial and industrial market. We're unique in this space in that we only focus on CNI. We feel that it's an overlooked segment of the market that didn't get a lot of love, certainly not the amount of love that it deserves. And so we decided this is something we're gonna focus on and support and make our customers as successful as they can be in this particular market segment. We have technologies that were made with the goal to convert commercial buildings into solar power plants. And from there, I'm gonna kick it off uh, to my good friend, Chris, and uh, I will be joining you back at the end to announce the Yada Swag and the Q&A. So Chris, without further ado, take it away. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you everyone else for joining as well. Appreciate you taking the time out of your day to learn more about our products and services. Uh, and while we're learning right now, the first thing I want to do is to talk about the name of the company. One question I get a lot in webinars, on phone calls, emails, is how do you say the name of your company? Is it Yoda or is it Yada? And the answer is Yada, not Yoda. Just love this slide. And then the question, next logical question is, okay, so now, now I know how to say the name of your company, but what does it actually mean? What does Yada mean? Uh, and Yada, just, just for reference, is... Uh, a prefix in the uh, SI system, meaning one to the 24th power or one septillion. And put that in reference, gives you an idea as far as what these uh, SI units are. Many, many of us are familiar with the kilo, the mega, the giga, the tera, uh, you know, 10 to the 12th power. You kind of work your way all the way out here to Yada, 10 to the 24th or one septillion. Just puts it in perspective. So again, the name is Yada and it's 10 to the 24th power. Uh, once upon a time, it was the largest recognized SI unit uh, in the world. Let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about the auto ecosystem in general, uh, all the products and services that we do provide. 
What we're going to talk about today, we're going to definitely focus on today is, as Ryan said, the DPI, 208 and 480. We're also going to touch on the solar leaf and the monitoring system. Uh, you ought to also provide uh, modules, solar modules, uh, 450 watt modules and 540 watt modules. Uh, as well as car chargers as well. But again, today we're gonna focus on these three here, the DPI 208 and 480, the solar leaf and the auto vision. We like to call ourselves energy storage ready. Basically what looking at here is a solar module plugging into the DPI. The DPI is the name actually comes from dual power input. You're actually able to get input from a solar module or from a solar leaf, which we'll demonstrate here in a moment. This right here um, shows four separate solar modules going into four separate ports on the DPI. Next slide here talks about solar plus storage. Again, that same module now then goes plugs in directly to the solar leaf. That's the input. The output then goes into the DPI 208 or DPI 480. And you may ask yourself, well, maybe I don't need a lot of storage. Maybe I only need um, you know, half amount of storage. Do I need to have a solar leaf on every single system? The answer is absolutely not. Uh, what we're demonstrating here is again, that same solar leaf, that same, 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 same solar panel, the same solar leaf going into that same single channel on the DPI. But we're also demonstrating that same product here, same solar module going into a solar leaf, going into the DPI. Here, we're saying dual power input because we're getting power from either a battery and or a solar module. So it gives you a much more flexible configuration. Let's talk about the solar leaf now. Yada Energy's approach to solar and solar and storage is very unique. Um, and what we're saying is truly integrated solar and storage. What we're doing is we're taking this battery, this solar leaf, pairing it with this microinverter on the roof. We're trying to simplify the installation and minimize the maintenance. This is what we're calling distributed energy, distributed energy throughout the roof. We're taking this module and this battery and this inverter, and putting it on the roof where it lives, not anywhere else but the roof. We wanna be flexible. Like we mentioned before in the previous slide, you can actually put a solar leaf adjacent to a DPI or with a solar module in general. Architecture that grows with demand. As I mentioned, uh, you could actually install today with just a microinverter and just a module and add battery storage in the future. Let's say you added battery storage, but you wanted to add more battery storage. The only limitation you have with the solar leaf is a number of modules. I need one module to charge one solar leaf that goes into one port of a microinverter. Of course, safety is a big deal as well. We wanna make sure that this is the safest system. We use lithium ion phosphate material uh, inside the battery for the maximum amount uh, of reliability, longevity, and of course, safety. And as we dig deeper in the presentation, we'll talk more about system cost as well. Uh, the cost of the devices, the cost of the hardware, plus also the hidden costs uh, with any kind of energy storage system. This right here is just a screenshot of the solar leaf itself. As I mentioned, we have inputs and we have outputs. Uh, the unit itself is probably uh, a little bit larger than a, a small suitcase and weighs somewhere in the rounds of 53 pounds per unit. Uh, there's all kinds of different mounting options. You see here, these are mounting ears, mounting tabs uh, for ground mounts. Uh, this is all can, also can be used on roof for um, ballast systems. We'll let this play through here quickly. This is actually just to give you an idea as far as how the system all goes together and how we, how we derive that panel level storage. Again, the panel is the module. The module itself will then feed into the solar leaf on the input. The output of that solar leaf goes directly into the one channel or any one of the four channels on the DPI. I'll let this play for a second so you can get a feel for this and where this is all lives on the roof. Some of the key specifications for the solar leaf today, 
we can put up to modules up to 750 watts. So that's 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 definitely competitive with anything out there on the market today. Uh, most solar modules in commercial space today are somewhere in the you know somewhere in the 550 600 range. Uh, so we definitely will far exceed that specification today. Um, we also can take 60 or 72 cell modules. That also includes the new split cell modules as well. So that goes to 120 split cell, 144 split cell, and also bifacial modules as well. The most important piece for me and for the company is the module compatibility is the voltage and current maximum inputs for the device. Uh, inverter compatibility is the auto DPI because it is, again, that dual power input. It can recognize input from a solar module and it can also recognize input from the solar leaf. Uh, today, the battery is a one kilowatt hour battery. And as I mentioned, lithium ion phosphate, safe technology. Um, as far as cycles are concerned, right now we're saying at 6,000 plus cycles. That cycled every single day equals to about 16 to 17 years. Uh, most commercial environments will cycle Monday through Friday, not on weekends. So we're anticipating a lifetime of this battery uh, somewhere in the 25 year range. As far as the mechanical specifications, as you mentioned, 53 pounds. So it is a, a single one person lift. The also nice thing about this, as I mentioned, this is a, is a ballast block replacement. Uh, most ballast blocks are 25 pounds. And uh, so two ballast blocks can be removed and putting in the solar leaf. As far as the weight on the roof, uh, not a significant difference as well. We're talking about 2.7 to 3 pounds per square foot. Uh, so not significant. That's all racking modules and battery. As I mentioned as well, attaches the PV racking, ballast racking. Uh, we've worked with many different racking companies, uh, Panel Claw being one of the ones that we use for the ballast mounting uh, roof mount, but we've also worked with companies like Unirac, Iron Ridge, and Solega. Operating temperatures, definitely anywhere in the range of anything we want to see in this world. Uh, the company, we're, we're not seeing anything higher than 150 underneath that module. Uh, and we'll talk more about temperatures and operating temperatures as we get deeper into the presentation. As I said, I said dimensions-wise, 15 by 26 by four and a half. Maybe a large briefcase, if you will. As I mentioned, panel cloth. This right here is just an example uh, of a of a panel cloth drawing that that would, customer would typically get. Um, panel cloth here. They give you some drawing, and they also give you a schedule as far as where. Um, ballast blocks are required and how many. The nice thing about this, where you see two, this can be a solar leaf. Uh, whereas one is a single block, but you can also put a solar leaf there as well. Nice thing about this, you'll know exactly where to put it, where to distribute the weight properly for that ballast mounting on the roof. As I mentioned though, uh, Panaclaw is definitely uh, one of our partners, but I said we, we've worked with Solega, Iron Ridge, uh, Unirac and others. If there's a company, so, and, if, and obviously, if there's a module manufacturer out there, I mean, a, a racking manufacturer out there that you prefer, uh, please let us know in the comments here, and we'll see if we can work with them and get a custom solution for them as well. I'm going to pause here for a second. This just gives you an idea of how it all looks on the roof. So this is obviously a TPO roof here. Uh, this right here is the panel claw uh, racking. You can see that there is a ballast tray, four blocks. Uh, this particular one here has a solar leaf here, solar leaf here, and just demonstrating the blocks as well. Sometimes they're really, depending on where the array is located, edge of the roof, um, edge of the array, it may require more blocks, uh, but this is just gives you an idea of how it sits, how it's mounted, and where it lives underneath every single module. So the question is, so why the solar leaf, right? That's a great question. So the great question is, looking at costs and why why would we think that this particular uh, product this oil leaf is is better than your traditional ESS right and right here it's like I call the water line this gives you an idea as far as what's going on and of course equipment cost is the first thing we're all going to look at and say what what is the cost to put the system in um, what I think is important about this and I like about this slide is it talks about all the different things so let's say for a traditional system there's a lots more engineering and design uh, involved because it's a larger system, there has to be fire suppression uh, systems put in. Um, you have to put foundation or concrete pad, or this could even be put inside a building somewhere. Um, it may require a transformer. It's the AC side, so it's electrical disconnects. And with larger systems, there are going to have to be all kinds of uh, material handling. These are all kind of things I would consider overhead costs that are really not considered in the, the equipment cost up front. When you're looking at the auto system, 
we think that, you know, the equipment is actually very interesting, but at the same time, we're trying to reduce costs by not having an engineering and design, because we're on the DC side, we're a DC coupled system. Fire suppression isn't a thing because now we're talking about a one kilowatt hour battery as opposed to a larger, let's call it a hundred kilowatt hour battery, 200 kilowatt hour battery, centrally located. Um, and also distributed throughout the roof under every single module. Uh, no concrete pads, no foundations, no separate, uh, uh, anything like thermal management is not an issue, which we'll talk more about here in a second. And it's a one person lift. You don't need any heavy equipment to be able to get this material to the roof uh, and manipulate it. It's a one person lift. This slide actually just kind of continues on with the previous slide, but just gives you an idea. So as far as material costs are concerned, you know, the initial cost, this is what we're looking at. It's kind of, it's very similar, but then when you start adding in, all, start adding in a lot more of the other things, the foundation, the trenching, landscaping, fire suppression, thermal management outside, uh, we start adding up quite a bit. And I think this is where you see where the, the cost savings actually comes in. Along with cost savings, there's also another thing in this industry that we also talk about quite a bit. And one of the things that we've been dealing with in the industry for a long time is clipping. Uh, having larger wattage modules come out as fast as they have come out, uh, the inverter companies haven't been able to keep up with the demand. Um, at Yada Energy, we actually were able to do that and actually keep up with that demand. We were actually keep pushing uh, the inverter harder and harder. And we've actually now had these two inverters, the DPI 208 and the DPI 480 volt, uh, which have a much larger range. And they can put up to almost 450 watts per channel. Uh, we're able to basically accommodate any larger water module today and uh, be able to produce that power. As modules grow, the nice thing about the solar leaf is we're able to capture all of that power. As I mentioned before, we can put up to a 750 watt module into the solar leaf. Nice thing about that is any kind of clipping uh, can be recaptured in the battery and then used at a later date. Uh, we're actually able to charge and discharge at the same time. So we'll be able to charge a battery push out power to the inverter to maximize the amount of power that's being made on that site at any given time. This chart is actually quite nice as well and just gives you an idea as far as what Yada Energy can do today uh, using the solar leaf and the DPI. The big thing right here is time of use management. I know many, many of you in the country don't have this yet. California has this all over the place where let's just say at 4 p.m. power doubles in price. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to be able to charge your batteries in the morning and discharge a solar leaf in the afternoon. Um, the other is energy demand charge reduction. Uh, as we know, uh, the energy companies now are looking at the spikes in energy. Uh, we're actually able to monitor the consumption of the building, um, see that demand, and actually be able to discharge those batteries on demand uh, to be able to reduce those demand charges. Also, energy arbitrage. Energy arbitrage is another big thing where the utility companies are able to reach into their system and be able to discharge batteries at any given time. Of course, the nice thing about energy arbitrage is they're actually able to pay you at a higher rate of premium for the power that you're providing at that time. Uh, this can all be done over the air, through the internet, through APIs. Uh, if any of you have a Nest thermostat uh, and you signed up for those programs where, the, where your energy provider can reach into your home and turn up or down your thermostat at any given time, it's the same kind of deal. Uh, they'll have access through API to be able to reach in and then discharge, uh, monitor and discharge the battery charge. So the next logical question is how do we do this? How do we make this happen? Sounds too good to be true. And it's not. Nice thing about it is we have all kinds of ways to mitigate heat on the roof. People always ask like, how, okay, that sounds interesting, but how do you do this? You know, and the funny thing is I always say, Microinverters 10 years ago, we all kind of laughed and said, you're gonna put power electronics on a roof? That's a pretty harsh environment. Uh, and I think after the last 10, 15 years, we've pretty much proven that uh, with good engineering and good thermal management, uh, anything can last on the roof. Um, so we're basically applying the same technology that uh, the microinverter people have applied 15 years ago uh, to now the batteries and to distribute that throughout the roof. And how do we do that, right? So look at right here, there's, there's three different things that we do to mitigate those heat issues. Number one, right here, we have what's called a vacuum packed ceramic bags. This right here is, is basically the thermos. What we're doing is we're putting the batteries inside of a thermos. Think about a thermos that you put hot coffee in the morning and then open it up at 10 o'clock in the morning and the coffee's still hot. 
that vacuum right there is a very poor conductor of heat. It will allow heat in or leave heat out. Uh, we're creating basically a thermos around the batteries. Number two, we also have a phase change material. Uh, this material itself, uh, when heated, uh, will go from a solid to a liquid, basically drawing heat away from those batteries uh, to maintain uh, the temperature that we're looking for. You see down here below on the right-hand side, the yada temperature range right here. What we're trying to do is keep a temperature range between 100 degrees F and 70 degrees F. This is the sweet spot for the battery right here. So by doing what we're doing with thermal management, we're actually able to maintain this chamber inside the battery chamber here within that temperature range. This, this chart below actually shows the, the orange line is the ambient temperature outside. Uh, the blue line is the temperature range inside the green, sorry, the green line is the temperature range inside the battery chamber. All the time, when we hit up to what, 140 degrees F, we're still well underneath that 100 degrees F inside the battery chamber. Number three, is we're using all the other technologies here to add the shield. We're using the, the thermal removal of heat and I'll bring it out to the outside case here on the heat sinks. These heat sinks right here are delivered, the heat is delivered to here via heat pipes underneath the battery packs. So the next logical question is, okay, that's interesting. You can heat, but let's say I live up North uh, where it's warm. I mean, where it's cold, we have colder nights. We, older, we also can able to maintain heat inside the device. But if we wanna add heat, we also have thin film uh, electrical heaters inside in between the battery packs to again to maintain that 70 to 100 degrees F. Safety is a big for a big issue for us right and that's that's true for both the microverter side and also for the solar leaf side. Um, everything on the on our system is a low voltage 80 volt or less system all which is considered touch safe by NEC. LFP chemistry, as I mentioned before, the safest in the industry today. Uh, Yada has gone through all the UL 9540A testing, uh, and within that testing, no external flaming was observed at all. And because, and that's all because of this thermal insulation we mentioned here, that acts as a fire blanket. There's also the safety by design, this distribution of the battery storage is on the roof now. Instead of having a larger system downstairs or in a building um, altogether, now it's distributed throughout the roof. Um, with a minimum of three feet in between each one, so there won't be any chance of any kind of propagation. If you do have an issue on a roof uh, or with a battery, it's one battery. It's not going to be the entire thing. And of course, NEC rapid shutdown on the microinverters. This right here is a quick case study. This just gives you a, uh, this, this can, you can read this laughter. Um, I have a QR code here. If you get your phones out, you can actually scan a QR code on the next slide. But this is just a, a good example uh, of that heat mitigation. Uh, this is an example of a, a site, uh, CSUDH, in the south of Los Angeles, uh, where we have a system set up. Uh, temperatures, ambient temperatures were very high that day, up to 140 degrees um, underneath that module. Yet inside the module, inside, inside the battery case, we kept it within that 100 degrees that we talked about on the previous slide. I'll stop here for a second. You can take your phones out and scan this, or you can come to our website as well uh, and be able to download this and read the entire uh, case study. But this just gives you an idea as far as two different days, two different uh, profiles. This right here is June 10th. And this June 10th right here, you see start of the day, and you can see that solar coming up and the solar waning coming down. Nice thing is you can also see battery storage. This is where the battery is being charged right here. At this point, battery is fully charged. And then from this point, until here, when we actually discharge the green, we're actually discharging from the battery uh, into the evening. Again, that's that, that reduction of cost for that time of use. Second here is another profile. This is in September, so just a few months later, but you can see the waning of the sun, the grow and rain, and then also the battery charge, and also a discharge. Same period of time, same site, different, different times of the year. System configuration. So this is really what it comes down to. We've been kind of made everything together. As we talked about before, the DPI 208 three phase here, you can put up to 20 modules on five DPIs. I can put five DPIs on a string, all which goes down to a 30 amp three pole single throw breaker. That all travels on a 10 gauge trunk cable. So the trunk cable itself has drops. The drops are every four meters or about 13 feet between drops. Again, 208, three phase, 
20 modules, five inverters, all down to a 30 amp three pole. On the TPI 483 phase, we can do up to 44 modules. So that equals 11 units, 11 inverters on that same 10 AWG trunk cable, all down to that 30 amp three pole. As I mentioned as well, 450 watts AC out per module, per channel. This right here is a configuration with the solar leaf architecture as well. So in this example, we're using the DPI 208. We're saying, okay, here's a module, here's a solar leaf going into a single channel of that microinverter. Then the output goes onto that trunk line. Over here, we're showing again solar leaf, and here, no solar leaf. It wasn't required for this particular job or this design. So it gives you that flexibility. That architecture is, is really fluid as far as what you need to do, how you want to set it up, how much storage you really need in the system. So let's talk a little bit more about the details of the three-phase microinverter, the DPI. As I mentioned, four inputs down here for four different solar panels. This right here is the AC output. Couldn't be more simple. And then in the middle here, you can just barely see it, is the Zigbee antenna. This is the communication device. This is how we communicate to the inverters uh, to be able to get information from the site to the gateway, the gateway then up to the internet so you can see the information remotely. Uh, we, we strongly believe reduces cost, operates at low voltages right here because the voltages are coming here are coming from the solar modules, which are somewhere in the 40 to 45 volt range. Fantastic. Supports up to four modules. You can do less. Let's say you had three, you can do three, which you know, just plug off two or one. Um, but nonetheless, very so very easy there. Flexibility is a really important piece as well. Being able to distribute this through on the roof, it's easy plug and play. The one big thing for me integrates native three phase microinverter right here. This particular microinverter is a three wire three phase, phase monitored, phase balanced, right out of the gate. So there's nothing to do, there's nothing to do on the roof, it's just simply three wires going down, two or three poles, single throw, Baker. Uh, monitoring, the Zigbee network, which we'll talk about, fast, easy, and safe installation. Couldn't be easier. Uh, if you've ever done a microinverter so a job, doing this in a commercial environment just changes the game. It basically, it, it, it makes it so easy. Uh, like I said, plug and play, and forget it. Some of the specifications for this particular product, DPI-208, up to 1,720 inputs output. That, that equals 432 watts per channel. The DPI-480, gone up a little bit higher, so 1,800, which equals 450 watts per channel. As I mentioned, native three-phase. Nice thing about this particular product as well, I'm gonna mention, uh, this actually will work in a bunch of different power configurations. So for the DPI-208, uh, that's a 208Y as, as we understand it. But this will also work in a 240 volt delta, a 240 volt delta high leg as well. We're really flexible on that particular product. Uh, the DPI 480, also 480 volt uh, Y, and also 480 delta as well. Uh, and of course, Rule 21 compliant, rapid shutdown compliant for NEC 690.12. Uh, for those of you not familiar with microinverters, uh, this gives you an idea as far as how all the AC trunks go together and how the amperage uh, will go up as you're adding inverters. So this example is the DPI-208. And the DPI-208 has 4.8 amps per unit out. So as you put boom, 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 five together, you're going to end up with 24 amps. So it's, it's cumulative as you build a unit. So the benefits of this particular solution, it is fantastic. Rapid shutdown compliant right from the start. Lower cost over the system and safe, right? The, one of the big things with microinverters technology is the inputs are all low voltage. Uh, there is no high voltage DC anywhere. Uh, the AC, uh, once removed, let's say there's like some kind of an issue at the building or site, uh, the first thing these first responders do is kill the power. This is touch safe within a, a tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds, uh, it is touch safe. As you mentioned, 6072, uh, actually not 96, that's, that's a typo there. 6072, 
um, and also the 120, 144, and uh, bifacial modules as well. Zigbee Wireless Nest Network, we'll talk more about that in a second here. This right here has changed the game uh, in the industry. Uh, as we know, um, in, in the day, back in the day, everyone used power line communication, um, and we did as well. Uh, we moved on from that to Zigbee Wireless Zigbee, which has changed the game. Uh, basically, we're, we're, we're speeding up the, the questions that are being asked. We're getting more information faster and more reliable. As far as the accessories are concerned, as I mentioned, it's a three cable, three conductor, four meters between drops, 30 amps, um, three phase cables, um, five units for 208, 11 units for 480. If for whatever reason, when you're running the, the bus cables or the trunk cables, if you need to miss a drop, let's say, this right here is your watertight, dust tight solution to be able to cap that and move on. At the end of the run, not the home run side, but at the end of the run, this right here is your AC bus cable cap. That's again, watertight, dust tight to protect the end of that wire. As you mentioned as well, let's say you have a, a, a odd number of modules on a roof and you have you know even number of uh, ports on that microinverter. Let's say you had three plugged in and you had an open port. All you would do is basically use these caps, these specific caps right here. These are the MC4 caps to clear off and, and watertight dust tight those two ports. And of course the disconnect tool. Uh, if you ever need to disconnect an inverter from the trunk line, this is the tool that would be used. This is just plug it into the, the opening hole, push in, and it separates it nicely. The next two slides here are just specification sheets. Uh, again, QR code, I'll stop on these for about 15 seconds or so. Uh, if you can scan these and download these if you'd like, uh, or come to our website, uh, please feel free to get those. This is the specification sheet for the solar leaf here. And the next slide, move on. Specification sheet for the DPI 208 and 480 combo. Okay, so of course, with any any product, uh, we have to obviously meet all the standards and codes. Uh, so for Yada Energy, so we actually are compliant with Article 690 in the NEC code for uh, PV systems, and also Article 706 for energy storage systems. Specifically in those, um, we're compliant with the UL 9540 uh, for the battery storage, uh, UL 1973 for battery storage systems, uh, and of course, UL 9, uh, 1741 for the inverters. Let's talk a little bit about monitoring. Uh, I wanna be able to demonstrate here. This right here is a, a remote monitoring system. Uh, can be accessed via a computer, uh, remote computer anywhere, uh, and or mobile applications as well. Uh, the nice thing about this is, is this will give you the ability to monitor remotely um, you'll be able to monitor every single solar leaf and every single um, DPI that includes the modules as well. So you'll be able to see a snapshot of the system. And the nice thing about this is you get this access in remote and real time. Basically, you're looking at a system that's reaching out and providing information every five minutes on the site. Nice thing about this, you'll be able to see the system help uh, very easily and quickly uh, remotely. Uh, the other nice thing about it, you'll be able to see performance issues. If there is any issue, we'll also be able to alert uh, the user of the issue. Uh, if there is any kind of issue, let's say there's some maybe a bad module, maybe there's some soiling, uh, we'll be able to identify that, uh, provide that information to the installer uh, to be able to be inspected and resolved. Uh, also inside this, we're also able to provide system graphs, output, um, and also provide troubleshooting as well. If there is any issue in the future, the nice thing is this becomes a real nice tool uh, to be able to see or compare side-by-side uh, -side modules, side-by-side uh, -side batteries, um, look at trends, um, and be able to diagnose things very quickly and easily. What's nice about it too, um, if there is ever an issue, um, you'll be able to actually send the, those people out with the right equipment. There's no more hunting and pecking. There's no more wondering on site. You'll be able to identify what the problem is before you can arrive on site and send the right person with the right equipment if needed. This is just a quick snapshot of the auto vision. Uh, we have another webinar about this particular product. Uh, we will be doing that probably in the next couple of months, um, just to talk about all the different perks and the benefits of the online monitoring and how to utilize this. But this just gives you an idea as far as uh, battery power, solar power, what's happening at any given time from the solar going into the battery, going into the building. Um, this gives you an idea. And all that's being done through the monitoring gateway. 
this particular gateway right here um, is is the is basically the the brains of the operation, if you will. Uh, the inverters and the so DPIs and the solar leaps are living on the roof. This particular device reaches out to them, uh, as I mentioned, every five minutes. Uh, during that five minute period of time, it's asking questions about best state of charge, batteries, discharge. It's asking about voltages on the modules. It's asking about conversion in the inverters. All that information is being asked, stored um, uh, every five minutes. So let's say power on, five minute mark, it will ask the questions. The 10 minute mark, it will ask the question. The 15 mark, it will ask the same questions. At that 15 minute mark, this is where the 15 minute rule comes in. They'll take that five, 10 and 15 minute data, push it to the cloud. So basically you're gonna have 12 poles or pole cycles uh, of the site of all the equipment on the site and four pushes of data to the cloud. Nice thing about this is you don't lose that granularity, but we only have four pushes of data to the cloud to minimize the amount of transactions on the, uh, the line. This can be used in split phase or three phase which is quite nice, and three different ways to connect this to the internet. Of course, the, uh, the ethernet is what is my favorite. Uh, it's most reliable, safest, and secure, uh, but we also have built-in Wi-Fi in the device and also an optional cellular dongle that can be plugged into the side of the device here. You can't see it. There's actually a USB port on that as well. And of course, my favorite, Zigbee communication. We'll talk more about that in the next couple of slides. As I mentioned, power line communication was and, and probably sometimes is the industry standard has been for a long time but many people are moving away from it because although fantastic although very good um, it can be choppy if there's noise in the line and especially in a commercial environment there's all kinds of noise in the lines especially with equipment motors anything running so by going through the air uh, we're able to avoid a lot of those collisions and a lot of those issues where the modules uh, the inverters or the batteries are not communicating um, I put it was Wi-Fi in here just to give it an idea as far as how this all works. So Wi-Fi and Zigbee are very similar in the sense that they are wireless communication. They're free to broadcast at 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, they have the same range, um, but Wi-Fi as we love it in the businesses and homes is a point to peer network. And what that means is that everything has to go back and forth. It's a, it's a communication. So you're from your router to your computer, your router to your game, your router to your Roku box, your router to you know, your Kindle or whatever. Um, it has to be that point to peer network. Zigbee is the same. So we wanna be able to talk to that, that Zigbee or that controller or that ECU, that gateway, whatever you wanna call it, um, also wants to talk to every single one of the inverters or batteries on the roof directly. But the nice thing is if you can't for whatever reason, let's say that's a, having a hard time talking to one of the people on the, on the line or the one of the inverters on the line, it can ask its neighbor. So with Zigbee, we've added the extra element of the peer to peer network. So it can peer to peer each other and also back to the point, which in this case is the gateway. Uh, this right here, uh, changing this technology from power line communication to Zigbee literally reduced our tech support phone calls by 50%. Uh, it, it has been a huge savings. Uh, so a big frustration point for a lot of installers looking for a good clean line to get communication to the roof, uh, where now uh, it all goes wirelessly through the roof. Uh, and with the advent of Zigbee, uh, that peer to peer communication is just solid gold. Let's get into the installation of all of these components now. This right here, we're going to run through this quickly, uh, but this right here just kind of talks about a panel claw installation and how this would typically work. And again, like I said, this, this is just panel claw here, but uh, we have had many installations with the Solega, Iron Ridge, uh, and Unirac as well. You see right here, what we're trying to show here is that the, the racking itself this is the ballast tray that's in here. And this is right here where we're going to be able to attach all uh, the inverter and the solar leaf. What we're doing right here is demonstrating where this right here is the mounting plate for the DPI. The mounting plate is a metal plate. It gets grounded through these mounting screws here on the ground on the racking itself. You're taking a tool. We're gonna to tighten these down to create that bond. At this point, we're gonna take the inverter, the DPI in this case, we're gonna slide it up into this mounting position. We're gonna add the bolts and then tighten those down. Underneath this particular piece, you can't you barely see it here. There is a weave and that weave out there will make the grounding bond to the racking. Add 
adding those screws and tightening it down. Once the inverter is in place, the next step is to add the solar leaf. And as you can see, the solar leaf is designed to be the same width as a ballast block. And obviously, like I mentioned, two ballast blocks in weight, but it fits nicely in this particular tray and adds that weight for the ballast. We're gonna mechanically connect solar leaf to ballast racking, make that grounding. We're gonna add any additional blocks per the plan if necessary. We're gonna be cognizant of the DC inputs and the DC outputs. As we mentioned, the DC input is coming in from the module. So we're not gonna connect that right now. The DC output as seen here, going directly into any one of the four ports on the microinverter. Of course, wire management's a big deal. Uh, in this particular example, Xen is panel claw. Panel claw uses the uh, plastic clips to make sure that all the DC and AC wires are captive. What we're doing now is you see in the background here, we're adding the trunk line. We're actually basically adding in the AC trunk line to the micro inverter. Wire management's a big deal. So here you can see wire management clips being used to keep those cables off the ground and on the racking. You can see now we're making the connections. All of the devices all have stickers or serial numbers on them. These right here can be pulled off. They'd be peelable. You can actually make a module map. You can also make an inverter map and a solar leaf map as well, all of which can be mapped in the, in the online Yaw division later. Now what we're gonna do is gonna put, we're gonna place the module. And in the module, we're gonna actually put in the claw to hold this in place. This right here is the claw and then the claw in place, holding that module. Once that is down and put in place, we're gonna pull the module back down and we're gonna make the connection. Now we're gonna to go to DC input. So the solar module is gonna get plugged into the DC input of the solar leaf. <clears throat> We're going to make that connection. We're going to lower the module down and clip it in place. And you'll see right here, it's got a kind of a claw or a tooth that's going to bear into the module, create that grounding path and lock it in place. And you're done. To complete the racking, uh, there also is um, inter uh, array um, buffers, plastic parts to do any kind of cable management to make sure that there's no wires again hitting the roof. Um, also put that in place. Wire management at this point, now we're gonna complete IC wiring and go all the way back to the electrical box through a transition box. And then set up the gateway to be able to communicate to all of the equipment on the roof. So in review, as we mentioned, the energy storage system that, we're still used, that we have uh, includes the Yotta module, or like I said, it could be our module, could be anybody's module, but it has to meet the voltage and current requirements, uh, which then goes into the Yada Solar Relief, which then goes into the Yada DPI 208 or 480 volt system. Just that simple. As we mentioned, this is a little bit of a review, but I think it's important. You know, lowest cost of installation. We really believe that because the BOS is so much simpler than a traditional high voltage DC system. Uh, efficiency is up as well. And like I said, scales for any kilowatt size project. So please reach out to any of our sales team. Uh, they can be able to provide you some information and provide you a quote, uh, give you a lot of information there. Uh, installed with solar PV, super easy. Accommodate future demands. Again, with the battery, you're actually able to be kind of future proof your purchase. Um, and there's no footprint or permitting for this. It's a DC side. It's on the DC side. It doesn't touch the AC. Safety, of course, is a big deal for us as well. The lithium ion phosphate chemistry is the safest in the industry today. Fire safe enclosure, 9540A tested, and low voltage with that monitoring system. All available, all for free, 
again, on the computer and on your handheld device as well. Right? Thank you, Christopher. Um, so before we move ahead a little bit further, I see a number of questions in there, but uh, we're gonna get ready to get to the Q&A. So if you have anything that you'd like an answer on, please put it into the chat now. We'll do our best to get to it. Um, just wanna highlight some of our partners here. Uh, we have many partners, all of which we're proud with, uh, proud of. Uh, we have distribution partners like uh, we're nation, uh, carried nationwide by Greentech uh, and Cranic. Um, we've got great partners at Austin Energy, CPS, NREL, uh, of course, who can forget the power store? Um, many more than what we have listed just here. Um, we're proud to be uh, partnered with all of them. If there are anybody else out there who is interested in a relationship with us um, outside of just a standard vendor installation relationship, uh, please reach out and uh, we'll see if we can't accommodate you. We are more, a heck of a lot more, um, I laugh because I'm, um, Chris is doing this from a hotel room um, uh, because he had to be called away at the last minute to uh, assist with an install um, and uh, kept his state in California an extra day so he'd be able to, to hit this webinar on time. So we've got all kinds of additional services that we provide just beyond the equipment. The equipment is where it starts. That's the very base level of what we supply. Um, we will take care of your um, analytics and proposal generation engineering and plan sets, uh, equipment procurement, of course, um, installation and construction support like what Chris is doing right now. We've got a customer success team, a number of individuals um, based out of Austin who are on planes at any given time flying around the country assisting uh, new installations. Um, project finance, we've got great partners uh, in project finance. Um, uh, so if you're looking to, to get some help on how you're gonna get this thing paid for, please reach out to somebody in sales. Um, and of course, Ongoing maintenance. And now the moment that I know you were all waiting for, uh, everybody's very excited about this, the winner of our swag MC, let's check with the marketing team, is Sonia. Sonia, you are our winner today of our marketing swag bag. So uh, somebody from our team will be reaching out to you to get some mailing instructions and you should expect that um, package very shortly. We have um, a few questions here um, in the interest of time. We're gonna keep it uh, a little tight. Um, Chris, you ready for me to pepper you some of these? Okay. Um, even though we talked a lot about the microverter, there are some questions on the leaf. So I hope you have, you're prepared for that. I know you are. Um, for demand management application with the leaf, can the inverters charge the battery from the grid or will there be a future firmware hardware update in the Yada roadmap that could unlock this capability? Uh, that's a great question. And, uh, and definitely a feature uh, that is currently not available today. So in generation one, the launch product uh, that is not available to charge from the grid, but uh, stay tuned. Uh, that is definitely a feature that has been requested and has been added uh, to future products. Uh, somebody asked if you could go over the panel output um, limitations of 12.5 uh, amps again for the solar leaf, or, or did they mishear you? Do you say that again? I missed the question. Um, please go over the panel output limitations of 12.5 amps for, again for the solar leaf, or did I mishear Chris? No, you heard that correct. So yeah, so that so so basically we're looking for voltages under uh, 60 volts is the maximum input for that particular device. Uh, we're we're looking for a sweet spot somewhere in the uh, basically 22 to 48 volts uh, for the MPPT range. Um, as far as the the out the input for current, yeah, 12.5 is is currently the the highest today. Uh, although that will be increased um, to 20 uh, here soon or shortly. Um, I'll take this next one. Is this system manufactured in the United States? As of no, it it as of now it is not. Um, but stay tuned. Obviously, there have been um, some uh, movements in the government that have certainly encouraged us to take a look at making um, uh, this product available uh, to be manufactured here in the US. It's something that we're considering very seriously. I've probably already said too much. I'm gonna get whacked by the CEO for probably even saying that much. But um, here's another good question, Chris. What happens when the ballast tray requires a full load of ballast blocks, but you wanna place a leaf there? Well, 
I mean, that's actually, that's a great question. So if it requires a full load, I mean, the ballast blocks, I mean, the solar lift can only take up to two spots uh, was it the actual weight. Um, they would have to be more on the outbound ends of that particular device. So they actually, we've seen where the array would actually extend it a bit more uh, to accommodate the leaf. I see a number of questions here uh, about are you, you know, do we have racking solutions for this manufacturer or this manufacturer? I will say that for most of you asking this question, and there are a lot of you, um, the answer is either yes or coming soon. So um, I will take the initiative. We will reach out to each one of you individually um, to make sure that we are, that we have the solution that you're looking for. And if we don't, we'll make sure we can get that going. So um, I don't want to address all of these individually. There's, there is a ton. Um, I will say that the um, we are sensitive to the needs of of and the and, and we know that probably the hardest thing for an installer to change is probably the racking equipment, right? Um, and so we are uh, confident and um, that we will be able to supply uh, support all of your, your your racking needs. So we're working on solutions for most, if not all, of the ones that I've seen so far. Um, Chris, is there a way for the Zigbee gateway to scan for the microinverters? Sometimes the roof crew may not record our, all the serial numbers. Actually, it's an interesting question. So they're, they're, so technically the answer is yes, uh, but we've actually disabled that feature uh, because uh, we're going through the air, right? So what would happen is if, if that feature was turned on, you'd actually be able to pick up or to see any Zigbee device uh, in the area. Uh, many of you have installed uh, other microinverter companies, I'm sure, uh, have had that automatic discover feature turned on uh, only to find that you've just installed 10 inverters, but you found 20. Uh, because you found the neighbor's inverters as well. Uh, so that's something that we're trying to avoid. Uh, what we've built in instead is the ability for you to be able to scan the inverters long before you even put them on the roof, before you even put them in the back of the truck. Uh, what we're encouraging people to do is take that ECU, their gateway, if you will, turn it on uh, back, in your, back in your shop, scan the serial numbers of the inverters that you're going to be installing the day of installation, um, and put them into there, basically install those serial numbers into the device. So when you get to the site, you don't have to worry about scanning or looking for those inverters. Those are already discovered, they're already there. Um, and the nice thing about our system as well, it's all different, driven from the DC side. So when you start putting the installation up, uh, the first thing you wanna do is get that gateway, turn it on and put it on the roof so it's ready to go and it's, and it's looking. And as I mentioned, every five minutes is looking for these inverters. So during the installation, I mean, in the morning, of course, there's gonna be, not gonna be an inverter or a module on the roof. But as you start building the system, you're going to start building that Zigbee network. Um, so by the end of the day, on your handheld device, you're going to be able to see that you've got good communication from the gateway to the inverters. Uh, you're also going to be able to see that you've made good DC connections because the gateway, only, I'm sorry, the inverter only requires a single module to turn on the Zigbee chip inside the device and provide that, that bit of communication. Um, so the answer, yeah. So the answer is yes, it's capable. No, we've turned it off, um, but we think we've got a better solution uh, and be much happier if you're able to scan those serial numbers in before you install the first inverter. Uh, if there is not clipping of the modules, is the total daily output higher with the leaf or without? It can be, it can be higher. Um, the nice thing is you, you, you get to choose uh, when you discharge and for how long and how much. So those are the three questions that are asked in the online portal. It's like, okay, so let's say for California example, um, I wanna discharge at 4 p.m. because my power rates go up you know, twice. I can discharge at, I don't know, let's call it 300 watts um, for three hours. Um, that's something I get to choose, I get to program that. So yeah, your output could be higher because you're actually charging that power in the morning and sending it out in the afternoon as the sun is waning down. So you wouldn't be making that power uh, in the afternoon because the sun is going down, but yet you're still pushing power out because you're discharging from the battery. Um, and that, that Chris, we're tight on time. So I'm gonna wrap it there. I will say, if you have asked the question, um, somebody from our inside sales team will be following up with the answer for you. We don't leave any of these hanging. I see one real quick. Um, no, there are no plans for an off-grid solution as of yet. Uh, sorry about that. Um, please follow us on our social media platforms at Yada Energy on Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and Facebook is Yada Energy ATX. You can visit our website at yadaenergy.com. Email us for support questions. Pretty easy to remember. Support at yadaenergy.com. Uh, sales questions, sales at yadaenergy.com. 
If you haven't guessed, you can find me, Ryan, at Ryan at yachtenergy.com. And Chris, you guessed it, Chris at yachtenergy.com. Phone number is 833-MY-YADA. Thank you very much. Um, we have a really exciting webinar coming up next month where we're going to have um, a senior salesperson um, who focuses on the California market talk specifically about the changes there and how our product can benefit um, uh, projects in California. So stay tuned for the advertising of that. So once again, I thank you for uh, your attendance here. Um, it does not go unnoticed. And uh, I see a lot of familiar faces and names who join us every month. Uh, that also does not go unnoticed. But thank you very much for your support. And we look forward to seeing you out in the field. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for your time.